Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm David Van Slyke, Dean of the Maxwell School, and I'm so delighted to see so many and hope that you and your loved ones are healthy, safe, and well. I'm so very pleased that Professor Bob McClure is joining us for this alumni event today. Bob McClure is Professor Emeritus of Political Science and Public Affairs at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Professor McClure served for 43 years on the school's administration and faculty, including as Senior Associate Dean, a Maxwell Professor of Teaching Excellence, and as the inaugural Chapel Family Professor of Citizenship and Democracy. His interests include political leadership and the presidency, democratic institutions, and mass communication. Citizenship education was the core mission of the Maxwell School right from its founding, as envisioned by the Boston businessman and class of 1888 SU graduate George Maxwell. According to Professor McClure, it was George Maxwell's view that no person blessed with a college education in America should leave unmindful of the blessings that American citizenship bestowed on them. And moreover, they should be good stewards of those blessings and work to share them with others. Bob remained throughout his career at Maxwell engaged in citizenship education. He was integral to and taught in the popular Max courses and provided among many, many contributions the leadership and vision for the development and launch of an undergraduate major in citizenship and civic engagement. The DNA of the Maxwell School has always consisted of three elements, outstanding teaching, high quality evidence-based research that also informs public dialogue and decision-making, and a desire to develop a body of leaders, especially trained in US citizenship, who will go out through this country as educators and leaders in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors to upbuild the foundations and bulwarks of citizenship intelligently and patriotically. Bob personified those three elements and remains an engaged emeritus professor, mentor to me and many other leaders and faculty, and a warm friend to so many former students. While he now splits his time between living in Florida and Canada, he is always in touch with the Maxwell School and willing to share his thoughts and listen and advise on a broad range of issues. When we think about those broad issues though, there are two that are deeply troubling. And rather than hearing me speak about them, I'm confident that Professor McClure will have his own uh, thoughts to offer. And I know that he's especially excited to take your questions. Finally, let me just say we are especially uh, thankful that Bob could reschedule and that you could all join us after we had to change Bob's original talk from two weeks ago when the overwhelming interest in his session led to a catastrophic failure of our online systems. We've since rebuilt and retooled and we expect to have a great and engaging session today. I'm so delighted to welcome and thank Professor Bob McClure for joining us today. Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Hold on, Bob, you're not unmuted. Bob, you're still muted. Now am I on? You're good. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Dean. You're a minch. Um, the personification of the very best of the, Ma of the Maxwell School. And I see you as a, as Madison would say, a fit character uh, to hold the position you are entrusted with. And to all of you who braved last week's um, failure uh, uh, to join us again, I thank you. Uh, I've seen in, uh, in, in, the, in this version, I can actually see people. And I've seen a, a lot of former students that I haven't seen for many years. And to, 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 to single out just one, May I say to Kim Campbell, it was so lovely to see you. It's been a long time, my dear. Um, and 
there are many others of you as I, I get a chance to see you. I will, I will, I will want to mention my thanks for joining in today. Um, also, I want, before we start, to mention what I know many of you know, but it goes so often unsaid. Uh, these things are made possible, as nearly everything in the Maxwell School is, by the hard work of the Maxwell staff. The school is unable to function without its staff. And I want to single out two today for special recognition who've been especially helpful to me in this uh, fraud enterprise. One is my um, designated school minder, Liz Armstrong. Um, Liz is the one who gently but persistently um, stayed after me to, to do this gig, even though I, I had reservations about my capabilities and um, appropriateness. She also stayed with me during the preparation. And so a special thanks to Liz. And then to Tom Fazio in ITC. Tom uh, is, uh, was my minder and hand holder through the technical side of this. He helped me uh, make this work on my ancient laptop computer which is so old that he actually purchased it for me and originally organized it back when I was still in the dean's office. You should know that until three weeks ago, I had no idea there was a camera in this computer. Um, and one last reminder or warning, this uh, start time, is um, often my nap time. And so um, this is going to be a race between me putting you to sleep and me nodding off. So I guess we better get started. All sermons such as this little sermonette begin with a reading from scripture. And so is this one. Scripture today is from the Old Testament, the Federalist Papers, the Book of Madison, chapter 39, uh, the last verse. The proposed Constitution is in structure, in strictness, neither a national nor a federal constitution, but a composition of both. The pandemic viv vividly exposes to us Madison's creation, which still dictates most of how the Constitution functions in American life. Now, nearly all Americans wish or dream or speculate that it was otherwise. Nearly all want to see one America and one nation. One nation governed by one government, governed by one president, one leader. How often do we hear uh, people just pass off the comment, the president runs the country? Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Those beliefs are more like fuzzy wishes. That they, 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 they become the fathers of the thoughts. But thoughts are not facts. The COVID pandemic lays bare the misbegotten understandings of many of us. You might call them our alternative facts, if you will. The pandemic exposes the many layers and structures of the Ameri of American constitutional government, which must mesh together to get things to work across a sprawling continent of many, many differences. As the saying goes today, let's follow the facts. 
let's follow the facts that the pandemic makes plain for us to see. I will touch on just five of these facts as I see them. My facts and my interpretation of them are likely to cause acid reflux among some of you, perhaps even many of you. But I hope my claims, at any rate, will prompt sharp questions and spark a lively debate after I'm finished here and we can all talk together. Now, one last sidebar. Some of you are probably already beginning to think that I'm uh, self-medicating with hydroxychloroquine. Let me assure you that I, I am not. As many of you uh, no doubt recall, I self-medicate with single malt scotch. It's safer and a hell of a lot more effective. Now, five propositions for us to contemplate. It will take me less than 10 minutes, I hope, to sketch them. And then we can all have at it. America's battle against COVID was always going to be a little more, a little less, a hodgepodge of continental, a continental hodgepodge of separate, 50 separate states, all managing in their own way, all with uh, uh, various levels of readiness and capacity, as well as thousands of local jurisdictions, jurisdictions just as ill-prepared. Democracies are not known for foresightedness. This was always one of the great criticisms of democratic government. Remember Pearl Harbor, Boy Scouts are prepared. Democracies seldom are. America's COVID response was never going to be a pretty sight. Efficiency is no more a high priority within the Constitution than foresightedness is within democracy. America's, America's one, one nation is, is, is in our, its geography. We're, we're, we're one America in our geography. We, 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 we occupy and share a large swath of a continent. And to that extent, we share a common destiny. We are made one people by geography more than anything else. Now that oneness, that oneness of geography is precisely what the COVID attacks, our nearness to one another. But the Constitution, the Constitution itself has other ideas about our shared space. The Constitution leaves most basic power of a sovereign people the police power, the power to regulate the health, safety, and morals of the people to state government. The pandemic falls smack dab in the middle of the police power, nowhere else. Governors and mayors using constitutionally um, uh, uh, based authority, they have the power to issue quarantines and to enforce them. Presidents don't. And even if a president were to try to assume such a, conti a continental uh, issue, a continental uh, quarantine, a, a lockdown as we call it today, who would enforce it? Presidents don't have enough cops. Above all else, it's arguable, the Constitution decapitates a would-be czar roaming the streets of the United States with minions carrying guns. This is not Russia. The 
second. So in a pandemic, what can American president do? What is his or her constitutional role? Well, he's definitely not the decider in chief. He has no explicit constitutional authority over individuals in America, except when con congressional statute authorizes him to have it. The most important of these in this particular situation is the uh, mid 20th century Defense Production Act and the early 19th century in Insurrection Act. In reality though, the president in today's situation is more like a quartermaster, um, a head shopping clerk, a ringmaster, trying to keep the whole apparatus, all the wheels and gears turning. Then he is a czar making things happen. America is not France either. The president does have one big authority as he plays the ringmaster. He has the microphone, he has words, he has the bully pulpit. And the power of words and the microphone is no inconsequential power. With his words, the president expect, is expected to calm a nation in a storm, a reasoning voice to all in America. He is to serve as a trustworthy explainer of the circumstance. He is the explainer in chief, the priest in chief. To fill the role, America could have no worse person than the president, than the current president of the United States. No 20th century president could not have done a better job in this particular situation than the current occupant of the White House. But even with a more fit character of experience and intelligence, America's pandemic response was always going to be a lot more herky-jerky and, and spotty than the efforts of many other countries. Third, folks who constantly expect uh, the, that we are all, who constantly repeat that we were all in this together, uh, uh, who aren't, aren't, aren't looking at the same data that, that I'm looking at. Some of, the, some of them uh, must be looking more at our geography than the data that's coming out of this experience. There is one pandemic for black Americans. There is one black, one pandemic for white Americans. There is one black, there is one pandemic for rich Americans. There is one black, a pa pa pandemic for poor Americans, for, for Americans who have ready access to high quality medical care, and for Americans who have little access to such health care. One for, um, for America's professionals, like many of us, and another for working folks who depend on their sweat and their hands to make a living. One for New York, and one for Texas, and one for Florida. In, in, in the constant reference to we're all in this together, I think we cheapen the rhetoric and we cheapen the notion. We damage the message because it's so at odds with, with what people know in their everyday life. The rep repetition doesn't increase the likelihood of it being so. It was, uh, it, 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 it instead, I suspect, thwarts it from becoming so. The, the repeating it again and again is one more example of, of it being father to the thought, but not to the fact. America is not Denmark either. 
we are told to follow the experts fourth fourth follow the experts in this just follow the experts that's a good maxwell message whoa now constitution the constitution doesn't even turn over all out war to the experts doesn't tell us to follow the military men, the experts in this field. It places all out war in the hands of a civilian. Nothing more, nothing less. There's nothing more deadly and fraught than all out war. And we don't leave it to the experts. Democratic leadership and citizenship is almost never about strict adherence to a single line of facts uh, portrayed by a single area of expertise. It's about judgment. And judgments have no simple metric associated with them. Americans in and out of office are called upon to make political judgments about multiple lines of evidence constructed by experts of all sorts to balance the competing evidence of competing experts and, and competing claims in real civic life. In any event, in the current and, uh, uh, epidemic, what experts? Just epidemiologists? Why not economists too? Experts in local cultural life and habits and expertise, for instance, like say governors. That's the political job. That's the citizenship job, weighing the expertise, not simply following it. The specialized experts job is to know about nearly only one thing. They are a specialist in one thing while forsaking understanding many other things. Experts are usually one trick ponies. And there are few, if any, one fact, one value political problems in America. Was the goal of the Civil War simply restoring the Union? are also about abolishing slavery, or a weighted mixture of both, or was it just minimizing life? Lincoln had to make a judgment about all of those things all mixed up together. And that he had to do under a great deal of uncertainty. That's the political task of citizens as well. The French prime minister, I'm not one usually fond of quoting French prime ministers. The French prime minister said two or three weeks ago, in the most succinct way, I think, um, what this era asks us to do. He says, it asks us to draw a fine line that must be followed. A little too much casualness and the epidemic returns. A little too much caution and the entire country sinks. He's asking us to apply political judgment. And political ju judgments are multi-value, multi-data, multi-variable problems searching for Goldilocks solutions. Not too much, not too, not too little, but just right. And just right is hard to find. It's a judgment, not a datum. And finally, the pandemic begs, I can't read my own writing here. I, I, I don't have the memory I once had. The pandemic lays bare uh, the just extraordinarily low trust Americans have in each other and in their institutions. 
compared with other countries around the world. Democratic governments like Americans rest more on willing compliance than on government coercion. Citizens must be inclined to comply with what they are being asked to do, much less than on co coercion to make them do it. Democracies have no more uh, guns than presidents to force compliance. Willing co cooperation is necessary and that takes trust. And America has never had a large supply of trust. America has always had trouble complying and being uh, a pliable people. Certainly the British didn't think so. No more than America is not Denmark, it's not Canada either. America's motto is not peace, order, and good government like Canada. Ours is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Live free or die. Always, always a possibility. Values every bit as much of, as facts shape political judgments. And America is full of conflicting values. Now, in closing, on top of the pandemic and the worldwide economic collapse it has caused, America is once again embroiled in turmoil provoked by its congenital cancer of racism. These are scary, complicated, uncertain times. For me, scary as much as I remember feeling walking up Pennsylvania Avenue in 1968 to the Capitol to go to, the, to, go to work as a legislative assistant. I was walking along the streets lined by soldiers with guns. Atop the Capitol were machine gun nests. It was a scary time. And as Bill Galson said in the Washington Post yesterday, Bill was there at the same time. Those were scary times then. And he thinks today recalls those same scary times. May our judgments, be good enough for these scary times. And may God look over a struggling America as well as over little children and this old Luddite. Amen. Now the questions. Bob, thank you. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. Um, Bob is happy to take questions. We would ask that you, uh, if you're able to, just raise your hand using the participant uh, logo at the bottom of your screen, or you can type your question in the chat box if you have a question there. If you type it, we will ask it for you. So um, I see uh, I see some, some hands going up right away. Um, Ingrid has a question. Ingrid, you can unmute your microphone and you can ask your question, please. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. Okay, very good. Hi, Bob. I met via Barb. Uh, I met you via Barb many years ago. Thank you so much for speaking with all of us today. Um, one have, of the have you got your video on so I can see you? Um, it does not seem to be an okay. option. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, normally it it, it is. Um, let me just try one more thing. No. We're, we're in a webinar structured um, situation, so that may not allow it. I apologize, Ingrid. No, but I'm it, not gonna but, get to see Ingrid. But okay. do, ask, do ask your question, please. Ingrid? I'm muting, yes. Okay, I think you can probably see me now. There you are, yep. All right, very good. Oh, yes, um, hi, Ingrid. I hi. Yeah, 
Nice to see you. Um, when Ben Rhodes was here um, at Maxwell for the Public Diplomacy Conference, he spoke about a uh, right-wing ecosystem of media, that there's a very well-funded effort on the right to share information from a particular point of view. That seems to have been heightened during COVID. For example, the president referring to COVID-19 as a democratic hoax and others dismissing the seriousness of this disease really delayed our response. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about potential solutions to the volume of misinformation out there about COVID and many other things. I recall during Watergate as a child that public opinion shifted because people were getting the same information. That's no longer the case. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Well, um, I'm not sure how much um, this fractured information environment in which we now live um, affected um, our preparedness. But I think it's part of our trouble. Um, mm -hmm. America lives in, a, in a, a much more fractured information environment than it did when I was growing up. And um, American information was dominated essentially by the three national networks um, and the mm -hmm. Associated Press. Um, but that was an anomaly in American life. That wasn't the norm. The norm was much more like it is today. The norm um, is much more like the 19th century when we had partisan newspapers um, filling the American political information system with, with all sorts of disinformation, as we would call it today. Disinformation is a standard problem that must be dealt with in a free society. If, it does, if, if that free society is one that doesn't all think alike. Now, um, how do you do that? Well, I'm old fashioned. I, I, I think you do it slowly by the competition of good information and good ideas gradually driving out bad. But, but, the, but the internet and social media make this a much more virulent a virus and a much bigger problem than it was in the 19th century. So um, it's a problem we've got to try to manage. But one way to manage it that I'm against is you can't shut some voices out because you think they're wrong. Or even if you think they are morally wrong, trigger warning. Um, the New York Times staff today, I, I'm appalled by the New York Times staff today, um, uh, saying that uh, they can't put Tom Cotton on their op-ed page. I think Tom Cotton's full of a lot of nonsense, but the New York Times, by God, has got to present all sides of argument, even the argument you don't like. That's democracy. And we're in danger of losing that. Both sides will not listen to the other side because they think they are either stupid or morally wrong, which they may be, both of us. Big problem. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? see. Robert, did you want to weigh in on that one or do you have a separate question? Robert had his hand up. Robert Porter. 
Oh, Bob, sure. How are you, Bob? Can you, uh, can you see me? You no, cannot. no, I got to see you. I know, I got to see my old professor. Bob, I'm promoting you to panelists so you can share your camera. Go ahead, Bob, and ask. Uh, unmute your microphone and ask your question. You're up. Okay. Or or respond to. Can you questions. can you see me? Yep. Yeah. Where the hell are you? Well, I'm 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 home uh, here in the Seneca Nation and uh, safely avoiding the pandemic. Oh, good. <laughs> good to see you. I couldn't resist the opportunity to uh, 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 join in. I, uh, I I miss my uh, my old professor. Well, I, I miss my old uh, constitutional lawyer. Uh, you, yeah, uh, so now I'm in for deep trouble. This guy has a real law degree, and uh, he's actually been a president. So, so now, now I'm in deep trouble. Robert, it's wonderful to see you. It's great to see you. You're looking well, and I, I, I miss the cadence. Uh, it's all coming back to me like PTSD. <laughs> That's wonderful. I do have a question. I thought, uh, you know, we've seen a little bit of uh, uh, your old adage that politics ain't beanbag, but I'm wondering uh, whether whether you have some lessons get happen. through, and that's important, Bob, that you remember that. And a lot of other stuff it wasn't important, but that's important. Go ahead. I'm well, sorry. having having lived through it a little bit myself personally, I I know I now know you were totally correct. Um, but what happens when? Uh, it isn't that the politics ain't beanbag, it's that the guy in the White House throws the beanbags and is, is so norm busting that it really flips upside down what we expect of uh, how the government's supposed to work. And, and now as a professional lawyer and lobbyist, you know, I spent a lot of time on this, but there's certainly been some chatter about uh, what happens if he suspends the election or tries to? What happens if uh, after... Uh, if we, he were to lose, he were to just really go off the rails in terms of a 90 day frenzy of, of really uh, obviously unlawful, but but really dangerous activities. How do you see the Constitution and the system putting a check and balance on that kind of, of, of outside uh, activity? Madison, as you remember or know from your own work, um, didn't think that the uh, Bill of Rights was necessary. He thought basically that um, words on pieces of paper didn't matter much if the people didn't have the character um, to live by the rest of the document. He caved for political reasons, and I think he was probably wrong in his judgment at the start of it all. We are better off with those words. But he was right in understanding that no document is a substitute for the character and will of the people who execute it. Um, what we're seeing, it seems to me, is a substitution of partisan zeal for democratic character on both sides. And we will survive that awful prospect you paint to the degree that the people inside the Constitution executing it have the character to stop it. Now, the first place it's got to stop is the American people seeing his total unfitness for the office need to vote him out, not narrowly, but substantially. If it's a close ec election, I fear he may try what you. If it's not, he's got more problems. But if he tries, I guess I'm most confident in the American military 
that they will not submit. Mm -hmm. Republicans in the Senate may submit. Democrats might feed the flames in order to pick up the pieces. But the men and women of the American military that I know will not participate. Bob? Uh, do, others, do others want to weigh in on that one? That's a big one. George? George, unmute your microphone and, and speak up. You should be able to unmute down in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Oh. There you go, George. OK. Um, yeah, so my question, which I posted, was how should the Supreme Court and the Congress react to a president who apparently doesn't know what the Constitution says and, even worse, doesn't care to find out? It kind of follows on the question of the military. Well, it's a, it's a good question, George, and I, 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 I don't there, – there's no ready answer to it. Um, they, could, they should react – much as they have been reacting. Um, the president has no screwy wall, in large part because the courts have made it more difficult for him to execute his silliness. Um, and the Congress has refused to fully fund it. Um, it's a slow grinding process. It's not, there's, there's nothing in American government that allows anybody or any institution to turn it around on a dime. This is, this is one of the, the sad cultural mismatches we have today. We have an 18th century constitution that's slow and grinding with a modern technological world that thinks in instantaneous nanoseconds. That's a huge mis mismatch. Now, over time, can the Congress and the courts get at him? Um, they have, and they continue to. But in the end, if he wishes to flaunt a, a, a um, a close election, only the guns can keep him from doing that. And that's why it seems to me, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I've never talked this way about any president. I, I voted for a lot of presidents that many of you didn't vote for. But, but, but I, but I, um, this guy's just different, and um, we all know it, or I think most of us do, are watching this, um, and we've got to vote him out. That's, that's, our, that's, our, that's our time frame. We've got four years with him, and we've got to survive it, and then try to move on before he does more damage. Bob, um, Kimberly Campbell Oxholm has a question for you. Oh, my dear. Kim, uh, please unmute your microphone and ask your question, if you would. Uh, unmute down in the bottom. Yep. Oh. There you go. There you are. Hi, Bob. Hi, my dear. Hi, so this is wonderful. You look just like your mama. <laughs> I always used to look like that. <laughs> um, anyway, I um, I have a grandson named Scott. That, but what I want to talk to you about is, or ask you about, oh my God, I feel like I'm back in the classroom. This is such a treat. Um, our partisanship, I'm so worried about our future. I'm so worried about our children and our grandchildren and whether or not our democracy can withhold this. And I'm wondering if, and it's simplistic, but is, is part of this problem due to the fact 
that we have allowed gerrymandering and that we have created a political system that encourages extremism? And is there a way, and if you think that is part of the problem, is there a solution to it other than changing who we elect? Can it be more than that or is it simply that? Well, um, our dangerous and troubling set of circumstances are a combination of um, nearly immovable forces, I think. Um, our partisanship is a legacy of our history. Now you and your dad and the Maxwell School all come out of that warm progressive tradition, which is part of America's tradition. Um, but it was a reaction against the 19th century tradition of partisanship. And progressivism didn't kill it. It competes with it today, but it hasn't killed it. And I don't think it can kill it. Um, reaction to gerrymandering um, and the use of experts to draw congressional districts and so forth is a fundamentally par uh, progressive and Puritan idea. And um, it may take hold. It may be part of the problem that's causing our partisanship. But it's a scapegoat, I think, for the more fundamental problem that Americans don't agree. They haven't agreed from the founding. We have fought with one another over these value questions from the get-go. We fought a civil war and killed 700,000 of us to try to sort this value disagreement and cultural disagreement that plagues our existence. And still, it lingers on. Um, some of it, I think, is, so I, I don't think there's an easy fix for it. We could have more competitive, expert-drawn congressional districts and we'd still have deep divisions, unless you gerrymandered those so as to make sure you didn't have the divisions. Um, part of the problem too, um, I think is, is an educational one that universities and the Maxwell School has played a part in, elementary and secondary education has played a part in. I think we've sold ourselves a bill of goods about who we are and about what we can do. We, we wanna believe the fictions, not the facts. Now, to some extent, it seems to me in politics, everybody's gotta paint a picture better than life really is uh, or we wouldn't do anything. But we can't be suckered by it. And and part of what we've taught in these environments is that we should all follow our own dreams and we should all act in our own interests and we should all loudly proclaim what we think is right. That's, that's a problem. Sometimes we're wrong. And then when we start yelling at each other, it gets rude and uncontrollable. We are a rude and nasty society today. And, and you and I in our zealotry sometimes are part of that rudeness. And we tolerate it in universities where people wanna do all sorts of things to each other that they should know better. And we should know better how to control, but we don't. We've always been a raucous, rude and rowdy society. And we've got to try to find some way to tamp it down. 
I fear it's too late. Bob, uh, Sean O'Keefe, fellow faculty uh, member here in Maxwell. Sean has a question for you. Sean, if you unmute your microphone, please this, ask. This is catch up time. <laughs> Sean, uh, down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, yes, it is catch up time, Bob. Member... <laughs> well, Whitman is back. <laughs> yeah, and, and as a member of the Rude and Rowdy Society gang, you've just referred to. <laughs> I think it's in the spirit of what you've invited. <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. I mean, in, 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 a, in a serious tone on that same kind of theme, though, I think part of what we're seeing today uh, is an expression of that rowdy society in, in what we think is an injustice, what we believe to be an injustice. And as a consequence, the response to it has been uh, a threat from the president of the United States to invoke the Insurrection Act. And I mean, this is just positively, you know, beyond the pale and has been used in history on exceedingly rare occasions going forward. But the posit you came up with at the very end of your comments is uh, the proposition that he may be um, unnerved by the outcome and consider it to be illegitimate come November. And if that be the case, imagine if you would, how that could be construed as a rationale under the terms of, you know, the law of the land and derived from the Constitution itself that would give him the authority to quell the inevitable chaos that would erupt if, you know, the results were he won. <laughs> this would happen as well, in addition to the opposite direction of when he loses or if he loses if that become a circumstance in which he considers that to be an illegitimate circumstance. How do you square that other than the fact that I, I concur with you that the armed forces of the United States are not composed of folks who would otherwise rise up to do something like that. But at the same time, uh, this may not be something that uh, resorts to their, their judgment in this condition, and it could become a long, protract, protracted argument in the courts. Speculate on that based on your premise at the very beginning of this being couched in the context of the constitutional frame in which we live. Well, um, if these worst case scenarios that people paint are realized, then um, I think the founders understood in those circumstances that their government would fail. Mm. You're, you're asking for a solution in the wrong place. A republic, if you can keep it. Um, and the keepers are you and me, buddy. Um, and... Um, I shudder at the thought. That's that. That's why. That's why these high offices have to be filled with men and women of fit character. It's less about what their policies are. Goodness gracious, there have been few policies that have ruined us except prohibition. Um, and and uh, it's it's the character of the person in the office, and the character of the people who surround him, or her. And and if we don't have enough of that, there is no hope. Bob, it's uh, four minutes to four. Um, there are tons of questions. I, I don't know. I, have, I don't know if you have any extra you're, time. You're near eighty years old. You you've got nothing to do. Um, I, I may, if this goes on, have to get my single malt scotch. I only have water in my glass at present. You have enough uh, for everyone, of course, right? I would. I would. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just went, went out 
at the start of the pandemic and made I made sure I didn't run out. Um, so no, if Great. people want to talk more, I'm we will thrilled to do it. We will keep I get going. To see so many people I haven't seen before. We will keep keep going. And uh, Ron O'Hanley, chairman of the Maxwell Advisory Board, has sent a note uh, saying he had to sign off for another call at four p.m. But how much he enjoyed being back in the classroom with you, Bob, and how he got the the knots in his stomach uh, as he did back in the day. So there you go. Um, Lisa Lisa Daly Layman has a has a question. Lisa, if you want to um, unmute your microphone, you can ask your question. Lisa, um, down in the bottom left, perhaps? Yeah, people aren't go. allowed to unmute until you let them. Gotcha. Oh, Lisa, it's wonderful to see you. And I don't think I have seen you with, a, with your new last name. Yes, yes. Uh, it's been a while. It's so good to see you. Um, so I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are about, as someone who I think, like me, is sort of constitutionally moderate, and I... I see what's happening with the imbalance of states and increasing imbalance. So the fact that Wyoming is so much smaller than California and headed further apart, it seems like we are getting to a point of almost absurdity where a very small minority can outvote a very large majority, but I don't see any remedy for it. Do you? No, I don't. Um, our Constitution, as you well know, was based on geography as well as population. It's fundamental to the Constitutional Compact. So American government is not just about people. It's about places and geography. And that can't be fundamentally altered without fundamentally altering the compact. Now, I've been plodding along unsuccessfully on a little book um, for some time now, several years. Um, and time will probably run out. But part of the reason there's no finish to it is because what I paint is a picture that can only be finished by changing what you see, by changing constitution, not just with an amendment here or there, <coughs> but with a new one. Now, are you ready to risk writing a new fundamental document of the Constitution with the current population and citizenry of America are given the moderate that you are, would you be willing to try to work around what we got? You know, turn, where's your microphone? Where's your microphone? You muted me. <laughs> oh, thank God I had my, I mute the woman. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't trust that. That's terrifying. But at the same time, I think we're headed to a point that really is going to reach absurdity, where it, it just, it seems like it will eventually be unsustainable. Yeah, if you look at it that way. But, but Lisa, look at it this way. Um, how much more is the vote of a voter in my, Wyoming in a presidential election, how much more is it worth a vote in California? Is it 50 times? I don't know them. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is either. Let's say it's 50 times. Yeah. So, so what's, what's the vote of a single person worth in an American presidential election? Wh whatever one... 130 millionth is. Yeah. This, this equality in this sense is an abstraction that is meaningful, but not to the sixth decimal point. I like to think about it, American government, is it good enough? 
not as a good, not, not as a, even good, let alone perfect. Is it good enough? Because that's all democracy is going to yield is good enough. One of the things in the pandemic that becomes so silly is we're worried over whether we've counted all these deaths and cases um, uh, within a single digit. Lordy me. <laughs> we're not going to get that right ever. Um, it's sufficient to know that it's a lot and it's going up or it's going down and there's more of it here than there. But precisely, is that what political judgment is all about? I, I don't think so. But I also think your point can't be simply skated by, by my sophistry. <laughs> because once equality, the sense that it is equal, that people do matter, is eroded for whatever reasons, foolish or not. It's, an, it's a tragic and perhaps fatal loss. Now, do others want to weigh in on this? This kind of question is one that in public settings until I didn't do them anymore, was the kind of question that I, all, that I got more than any other. Who are you working for this campaign? I'm. <laughs> God, God, God bless your soul. <laughs> Bob, um, Ed Belkin has a question. Ed, uh, we'll enable your microphone, then you can unmute and ask your question. Professor McClure, delighted to see you again. I'm going to go back to the class of 1972. Oh, yes, there you are. And, so it's good uh, to see you. No, I was delighted to have you as a professor then and to see you now, of course. And I think back fondly to that time, uh, Michael O. Sawyer was another professor, Carl Schmidt and the like. So I go back to that era, as I know some others on the call do as well. A couple of quick questions uh, and, and turning back to some of the things that had been posed before. So let me ask first, how long it's going to take to repair the severe damage caused by Donald Trump, William Barr, Mitch McConnell, among others? And then also, how is it that it takes the courts so long? They fail to expedite rulings in cases that critically affect safeguarding our Constitution. This was so evident uh, tied to the impeachment trial and the like, and rulings that had been hanging out there for more than a year were left unsaid, undone. What, what can you uh, say to that, please? Well, let's take them in order, Ed. Um, how long? Um, well, I can't put a number on it. Um, it won't be quickly. It won't happen overnight. Probably it's not going to be a short time. May not be a long time. But nothing in America is righted in much quicker time than it was put than it took to put it wrong. I was asked by a smart aleck like me on my dissertation committee, my, on my oral defense, I think, of my PhD. Um, how long would it take us to get out of Vietnam? Now, well, it had nothing to do with my orals, really. And he was just mucking around, as professors are wont to do with PhD students. And so I shot back. It'll take us as long to get out as it took us to get in. And that's my standard rule for the way American government works. I was talking with someone about the arc of justice in the United States. 
The arc of justice may, or the arc of history may, may bend toward justice, but it bends ever so slowly. Um, now, one of the things it will take to right some of what's been wrong here is an overwhelming victory by the opponents of those that caused the disaster. Democrats can't win this election or any future election if they are to right these wrongs by, by anything other than an overwhelming majority. Um, the constitutional structure simply requires the acquiescence and cooperation of too many separate moving parts for any one part to undo everything that other parts have helped them do. And so um, uh, if the Democrats control the Senate, that may help for the future, but it's not likely to help undo much of the past. Um, once you put something in place, it's, it sticks. It's why I'm a conservative, Ed. Do no harm, because if you do, once it's there, you can't get rid of it. That's why we still have agricultural subsidies for things we no longer need. So, so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm weary, uh, weary of, and weary of activist governments trying to think they know what to do now and doing it. Because then you're going to find out that a lot of the time they're wrong and we're going to have to undo it. So the future is um, slow and fraught. Now the courts, you, 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 you guys out there know more about the courts than I do. I think my son's in the off, in the audience. He, he's likely to cor correct me about a lot of this. Um, but the courts rely on slow procedures. And I'm reluctant to have the courts reach down and pick out cases just because they seem to be pressing in the political arena. Because the court is not a political branch. It decides cases and controversies that are presented to it in an orderly fashion. And then it tries to provide a deliberative, carefully expressed response. I don't want my courts in the middle of all these political controversies. Take them only if you must, and only in due process. For instance, this notion that, that district court judges in California can issue injunctions against a president of the United States that stand across the whole geography are, are, are dangerous precedents. I agree with Justice Thomas on that. So I, I think the courts have acted in these cases reasonably and with due restraint. Go ahead. I gotta unmute, I gotta unmute again. But if the house is on fire and demands the courts move expeditiously to have a ruling that's hanging out there, in some cases more than a year, is that not absurd? Well, it depends on what 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 the what the rule is and how what's burning and how 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 raging the fire is. Um, 
just because it looks like you'd like to have it and you want to have it now is not sufficient to me. I, I see nothing that the court's delay has in any way jeopardized. Rulings about testifying before Congress by members, cabinet officials or West Wing officials to testify, that was all in abeyance, put in abeyance. Fair enough. And as a result, you, you, you think you think you think one 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 more testifier is going to change anything that we now know. Well, uh, waiting on book deals to <laughs> then open the door for someone to publicly say, and perhaps would have changed the landscape, and maybe made some senators break ranks. And to say, you know what, we should have witnesses. Um, you may well be right. But um, from my days in Congress on the staff a long time ago, and watching Congress since, I do think that Congress can sometimes be engaged in fishing ep expeditions bordering sometimes almost on witch hunts. I think Adam Schiff is not immune to the disease. I'd want to be careful. Well, and I had worked on the staff of a, a U.S. senator as his head of communications, yeah. someone who was a moderate, who actually crossed and voted more than half the time or half the time with people from the other side. And that was a refreshing time. It's so polarized now uh, that sadly, as we, I think, uh, lament that uh, too many sit on their hands or are fearful of a tweet that in their view will unseat them. And one has to pose the question, you still have to look in the mirror at the end of the day. You do. But, but Ed, you and I were there in the anomaly not in the norm. As I said to Kim, this acrimonious, partisan, vitriolic environment is more typical of American politics than the period of time that you and I were blessed to work there. And I think the, the communication environment has only made it worse. So, um, Justice Roberts' court has its work cut out for it. Bob, I see, um, Ray, you, you had typed a question in the chat box. Do you want me to ask it for you or do you wanna ask it via your microphone? Up, it's entirely up to you. Who um, is this? Uh, Ray, Ray Maller. There we go. There you go, Ray. A little, little trouble with the uh, the unmute button. No problem. Um, yeah, yeah. If you don't mind, I'll I'll just ask it because uh, I'm I'm interested, uh, Professor, to hear you talk or elaborate a little bit more about the character of Americans. And I have a two part question for you. So, how do you evaluate the character of us Americans who have difficulty trusting institutions and have long term sins such as racism? And what is it about our character that we seem not yet to have destroyed ourselves and have somehow been quite successful. Well, as anyone will tell you, Ray, in politics, luck is the most important quality to have. And Americans have been lucky more often than they realize more often than we realize. So our circumstance geographically and the low expectations we had for central government um, covered up many of our sins. And then, and then um, our 
natural resources and the resources of the world that we dominated for so long allowed us to buy off um, the sins that we, the, the sinful that we wanted to allow to keep being sinful. So, 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 so we had a lot of slop in the system. Uh, pork, for instance, I, I'm a fan of pork. You gotta have a little pork to make the system work. And, um, uh, and so uh, when the pork becomes hard, uh, character becomes more important. And um, uh, these more stressful times demand more character. Now, have Americans ever had um, an abundance of character any more than other people have character? Well, that's, that's a hard one. We're not a bad people. We're not a people without character. Um, we are people that have um, a strong sense of independence and willingness of trying to tackle things as best we can on our own. That, that flinty independence is a mark of good character, I think. Um, I think compared to other nations, we are a relatively welcoming people. I didn't say we were welcoming. And I didn't say that we um, weren't intolerant of some that we found here and others that we didn't welcome. But, but um, I'm always struck by how when uh, immigration comes to France and Denmark, strong critics of the United States and many of its policies with respect to race and immigration, the French and the Danish don't look so good. Dealing with differences and others is hard and it takes character. Have we always had enough? No. But on balance, I'm proud to call myself an American while recognizing that we have many, many defects. And it can be either a, a defect or a virtue, which is true of all virtues and defects, <laughs> that we don't trust power. We never have. And so uh, our, our congenital distrustfulness has sometimes served us well and sometimes serves us ill. But it seems to me this is true. If you want the central government to do lots of big things, you got to have trust. If that element is not there in the American character, in all these big dreams people want to have and all the plans they spend, spend out. My God, one more plan to remake America. You're blowing smoke. Plans without trust. Or command. I see the Secretary of the Navy is still up there. Um, if I've got command and control, people just salute. Um, I can get some pretty big things done, even if they don't like them. But not an American government. So, Bob, uh, we've, we've got people asking for a second session uh, in the weeks to come. So we may uh, we may need to or, uh, in, infringe on your time a little more if Barbara will allow it. Uh, in, the, in, in the near term, though, uh, John is on the line and I think he has uh, he has a question here. John, you still with us? I'm here. Is this John Mike? Oh, this is my son. <laughs> <laughs> I said All to Scott right. only. How are you, you going to nail me? <laughs> I said to Scott, I was only going to speak up if you wanted to be heckled by me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I was struck by something you said earlier that I, I was curious if you'd reflect on um, something I, 
you know, have heard you say things like it many times. You emphasized earlier the, the limits on the American president, that this is not a czar and that he does not have bands of armed soldiers roaming to enforce his commands. And I was struck by, uh, on Monday, I had a call with a friend of mine who grew up in Brazil um, during the military dictatorship in the 60s and 70s. And she was terrified after Trump made this comment about taking over for the governors and having been well-trained by you. I said something very much like what you said um, and urged a kind of prudence. This hasn't come to pass. There are plenty of limits on the American executive. Only to read in the last couple of days that um, to see pictures of soldiers standing ready on the Lincoln Memorial, to read about medevac helicopters flying low enough to uh, disperse crowds with the runoff from their rotors, to watch peaceful protesters dispersed by chemical agents outside the White House, and to learn that the DEA and other agencies have been given greater latitude than they ordinarily would be to um, enforce and uh, surveil the American people. And so I'm wondering the extent to which your point about the limits of the executive um, and the comfort we should all take in that. I'm wondering if you would reflect on that and the, and this, the news that we see now uh, all the time through the public turmoil. Um, and particularly the extent to which the character of the American people that you've elaborated so much on and, and, and that, I, that I've taken so many lessons from, the extent to which um, perhaps the American character has changed and that the appetite for somebody like Trump um, means the rules and the limitations that you would have expected to live by are no longer in force. Well, I saw the same things you saw in Washington on the news last night. Um, I asked myself, um, was the helicopter part of uh, the DC National Guard unit or was it um, an active Armed Services military helicopter. In some ways it doesn't make a difference, but I wondered. Um, was the, the those DEA guys? Um, that's that's bad stuff. But but those DEA guys, uh, they're not enough of them. They're mischievous. They're a bad sign. But that's not what's running around in Brazil. Um, so I'm still hopeful. But I'm not unmindful of what your Brazilian friend sees and what you and I worry about. Um, there has always been a strain in the American character that looked for a man on horseback. They may have, that strain, many of them, my ancestors, would have given us um, Andrew Jackson, for instance, who in his own way came close. Um, Lincoln didn't win by a landslide even in 1864, and McCullough, McCullough would have would have come close too. So there's always been that strain. The question is whether in today's world, it's the character has been that that strain has been enhanced, um, encouraged. Um, developed. Um, 
and in some ways I can see it can it has or it is being I worry that's what Trump Trump is doing but but on the other hand the proof of the pudding it seems to me is what happens in 2020 um, everything's riding on that we can't we can't call it I can't I can't call it till the ball is over the plate. And it's just left the pitcher's arm. History's, uh, on, history's on our side. But modernity, modernity is not. Thank you, Bob. Um, the dean did have to run to a four o'clock. Um, it's now <laughs> it's now four thirty. Um, so we have lots more questions. I, I appreciate you being willing to to perhaps sure. do this again. Um, in my role here as a as associate dean for external affairs at Maxwell, I get to travel in normal times. The the country and in fact the world um, talking to alumni and friends about the school and there are a handful of names I hear all the time and I hear Bob McClure's name as much as anyone's and uh, I've long known Bob and have appreciated his uh, his kind and generous counsel um, but to to feel as if I'm sitting in a class I feel like I've gained some 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 added piece of Maxwell understanding right now. So I'm delighted. So thank you for that. The Dean says thank you as well and, and how pleased he was to see you and to see you doing this, uh, this, this for us. Uh, we certainly thank everyone involved in the, in the session. As Bob mentioned early on, uh, Jess Murray, our Director of Alumni Engagement, uh, Tom Fazio, Head of our Information Computing Team, and of course Liz Armstrong who wrangles Bob and others. Um, a reminder next week, we'll be hosting another Maxwell faculty Q&A with Associate Professor of History, Osama Khalil, who will discuss US foreign policy as affected by COVID-19. Um, and that will be on June 10th at 2 p.m. And the following week, Wednesday, June 17th at 2 p.m., Tina Nabachi, the Joseph A. Strasser Professor of Public Affairs, will pre present and discuss defending democracy. Um, Bob started us down that path today. I think Tina will take us the rest of the way there on the 17th at 2 p.m. Can, uh, like, can, I, can I ask uh, please? a special privilege and point of order? Of course. I don't know whether it's still possible, whether Sam Gochin is still uh, hooked up. Is Sam on the call? I saw, I, I, he's on my list of. Let me see if we can connect, let's see. I'd love to see him and hear him. I did not realize he was on. Let's see. I'm, I've been hi, on. Hi, Sam. Hi. I don't know. This is a little on. treat. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly yeah. where you are in your, in your home. Yeah, that, I'm right there. Oh. Yeah, I've been yeah. there since 3 o'clock. Are you well? Yeah, I'm well. I'm uh, uh, two months from being 93. You know, uh, when you're 93, you have days of good days and bad days, but uh, mentally. Well, I aspire to your condition, my good man. Yeah, that's uh, so. Uh, but uh, can you see me? On, oh, yeah, uh, I can see you. Uh, I can okay. see you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me take my it's glasses wonderful. off. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. Oh, yeah. you're, you're looking very well, Sam. You look great. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah, I, I, if there is a Mr. Maxwell, uh, it's got to be you, buddy. Well, uh, no, uh, no. So, so anyway, Bob, I, yeah, go, go ahead. No, no. So, Bob, thank you for uh, reminding us that Sam was on. So good to see you today, Sam. That's just thank a treat. You. Yeah. An added treat. So thank you all for this wonderful day today. Thank you for uh, joining and for all that you do for Maxwell and for the and university. you're gonna pull the plug? So you're gonna pull the plug? We are gonna pull the plug. We have this recorded. It will go on our YouTube channel. For anyone else who would like to see it, please tell your friends to check out. We're amassing quite a library there. And we will uh, schedule at, at his convenience another session with the good Professor McClure uh, to do this again uh, sometime soon. But as I said, we've got two lined up for the next two weeks, and we hope you'll join us on those as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh